So today we're going to be wrapping up this series, which has ended up being two series, starting with Stop Trying to Be a Christian, and then now we are on the keys, uh, or I'm sorry, Kingdom Keys. So um, today is going to wrap that up. Hopefully in some way, shape, or form, I have shown you somewhat I'll call, of a formula to see that God's Word is instructions, not just for how to get to the other side, Rodney, but how to endure as a child of God in this kingdom because His design for our lives in His kingdom is for us to live as citizens, ambassadors, and children of the King. That's how He intends for us to live. And He left us keys to have access to His kingdom. Today I'm going to preach on something that is, uh, it's going to touch on some things that we sometimes shy away from in church, and hopefully you will see today that we don't need to do that, and that we need to understand what God says about all of His keys, all of His keys of the kingdom. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 17, if you will. Just to give you some background in 1 Kings chapter 17, as you are turning there, that... Um, there's a prophet that we've been introduced to in chapter 17 that's called Elijah. Elijah has prayed. There is an evil king and queen over the nation of Israel that is called Ahab and Jezebel. And there is worship of a God named Baal. Okay, It's important for you to understand that in this time, which was many, many hundreds of years before Christ, um, that there were gods that people worshipped, false gods. Uh, in the coming months, I'm going to be teaching you and showing you the origins of some of these false gods and where they came from and what the Bible teaches us about them because the Bible says, Jesus said, in the last days is going to be as like the days of Noah. And I'm going to show you that in the days of Noah, they had false gods that they turned to. And I'm going to show you how we are in those days that Jesus prophesied of the days of Noah. But at this time, they had a God by the name of Baal, okay? And this God by the name of Baal was the God who, in their traditions and in their teaching, provided their every need for day-to-day -day life. Specifically, it gave them the rain that they needed to grow their crops. They worshiped Baal, and God moved through a prophet by the name of Elijah, and he prayed that there would be no rain on the earth for a long period of time. A drought ended up being more than three years of no rain in the nation of Israel. Elijah prayed for that to happen. One of the keys that you need to understand in the kingdom, if you don't recognize what your source is, you don't recognize who your provider is, and you are giving God no credit, no glory. One of the keys of the kingdom teaches me that once you start doing that, don't be surprised when you find out that God cuts off your supply. And you will soon find yourself in need. Okay? So the prophet Elijah has prayed for this to happen, and he has had to go to a brook called Cherith to drink water, and ravens give him food. Okay? There's a lot to teach on. There's so much I could teach on there with the brook and the ravens, but we'll move on. We'll do that another time. The brook dried up, and the ravens quit coming, okay? Just a very simple side note here in the kingdom of God. Just because what you've been used to has somewhat dried up and you're no longer getting from that same source anymore doesn't mean God left you. Sometimes it just means God didn't intend for you to stay in that position forever, and he needs you to get up and go. And sometimes the only way to do that is to make you unable to stay where you are spiritually. Okay? I'll move on from that. And in verse 9, verse 8 of chapter 17 of 1 Kings, we'll start reading. Verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded 
a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. <coughs> Excuse me. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel. Let's see. Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go and do as you've said, as you've said but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. Verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoke by Elijah. Whew, in the three minutes it took us to read that, God zapped me with about 15 different things. I don't know if I have time to get into all of them, but wow, there's a lot here. Let's start with it right here. He's sent Elijah to a city called Zarephath. And he said, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain you there. Now I'm going to stop. And if God tells me he's sending me someplace and God's commanded somebody to provide for me, what I'm expecting is that there'll be somebody waiting at the gate with a sign holding up saying, Prophet Elijah, like we're waiting for him. We've got you a room at the Holiday Inn. We've got you a buffet ticket. We've got everything ready. If God tells me that he's commanded somebody to provide for my needs when I get there, personally, that's what I'm expecting. But Elijah shows up, and here's some widow that didn't even know he was coming. She's gathering sticks for her and her son to make one last meal. And she says, we don't have anything after that, so I guess we're going to die. But God said, I have commanded her to sustain you. Here's what you need to know about the kingdom of God and the keys of the kingdom of God. If you are walking in obedience where God told you to be, when God told you to be there, and you went when he said go, here's what you can expect. That when you get where you're going, God has already taken care of what you're going to need when you get there. And whoever's going to provide it and whatever's going to provide it, they don't even know they're being used by the hand of God. But he has come before you and taken the hands of heaven and orchestrated this world to take care of you when you get there. Elijah has been sitting by this brook drinking water, eating meat for, I don't know, weeks, months, it doesn't say. But Elijah has gotten used to God sending things for him to be there. But he said, Elijah, you ain't doing me no good by this brook. You've gotten strong. You've, you, you've gotten what you've needed here, but you ain't doing me no good by this brook. The other key of the kingdom that you've got to understand is God did not create you and make you to be some ornamental piece in a church somewhere and sit by a brook and just let God send the water, send the raven, send the bread. That's not what he intended for you to do. If he's put you in that spot, understand he's doing what David said, Lord, make me lay down in green pastures. He's getting you strong. He's getting you strong in the Lord because he's about to pick you up and say, get up and go and do this thing. So, mm. so he's told Elijah, go to the Zarephath there's a widow woman who's going to sustain you I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you he shows up 
Nobody picks him up at the airport. Nobody's holding a sign. Nobody's expecting him to come. He shows up to the woman's house. She didn't even know he was coming. And, 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 but Elijah is there, and Elijah knows that the word of the Lord's told him to be there, and God's going to provide. You notice that God did not spell out a whole bunch of instructions and say, now here's what I'm going to do. You're going to get there. There's going to be a woman. She's going to be gathering sticks. She's going to think this ain't going to work. You tell her to make you some cake. She ain't going to like that, but she's, you'll convince her and everything. And he never, he just said, go, I'll take care of it. That's all he said. Go, I'll take care of it. Do you know that sometimes God cannot tell you how it's going to go because you'll mess it up. Do you understand if God told you every step of the way, do you know how much we would mess things up? Sometimes all you can do is know the next step and just take it. And God, when I get there, I'm trusting. Because only knowing the next step means you have to walk by faith and not by, it's almost like God intended for it to be that way. It's almost like God instructed us one time. It says, walk by faith and not by sight. So Elijah shows up and he says to the woman during a drought, fetch me a little water. Now she's got a well there. It's probably not much in it. And what astounded me, Jeremy, was that she didn't like buck at all at this. Get me a little water. Okay, I'll get it. She, like, she's ready to die. She's ready, her and her son, like, she has nothing. But a stranger who she's never met, get me a little water. Okay, get the water. She, nothing. Until I realized how many times in Scripture somebody would come along and say, get me, a little, get me some water. Jesus did that, the woman at the well. Okay. Man, I think Isaac did that, or the servant of Abraham did that one time, came and showed up and, you know, get me a little water. God help me, I'm getting names confused. And, and people just, yeah, sure, fine, whatever, yeah, we'll do it. That was actually a very traditional custom. Didn't matter, somebody shows up, get him water, get him water. It's a, it hadn't rained in like months, get him water. Apparently the well has not completely dried up, dried up yet, she has a little. So get me a little water, sure, fine. What's interesting to me is to understand she would have done that for anybody. It was not a stretch, or let me put it this way. It was not a sacrifice for her to fetch him some water, even during a drought. It was customary. It was expected. And she did it without thought. Then Abraham pipes up and does what is not traditional. As she's going to the well, he says, also... Make me a morsel, I don't need a lot, make me a morsel of cake, whatever bread cake she was making or whatever she had. Make me a little morsel that I can eat. Now we've hit something because she goes, oh no. She was just going to do the expected thing. She was just going to do what is traditional and what is expected, what is customary. But now he's asking for something more. And she says, oh, I don't know about that. All I have is a handful. That's not much. And it's hard for us to imagine we modern day 21st century Americans with our portion sizes of our meals that are like five times as big as they were 100 years ago. You know, we, we eat a lot. This wasn't much. This was like a little crumb. This was a little. She had enough to make a little tiny piece of whatever bread or cake she had the meal for, the mix. Just that much. And it was enough for her and her son to have a meal that wouldn't even save their life. It was enough for them to get it in their mouth and taste it. And she said, and I'm going to do this. And after this, me and my son are going to die. She had no plan for after that. One of the most awesome things I've ever discovered all throughout Scripture is a theme that keeps taking place. Here it is. God excels at taking people who have nothing left. 
Not people who are like, I've got all this stuff. People came to Jesus like, I've got, all, I've got, you know, a rich guy came to him one time. And Jesus is like, I can use you. But I'm used to using people who don't know where tomorrow's needs are going to come from. God excels at taking people who have no plan after today. I don't know how tomorrow's going to happen. And he takes those people. And he says, this I'm going to get glory from. I can take somebody who has nothing left and I'll use them. I love that because I can't tell you how many times I've been before the Lord and I said, I've got nothing. I don't have the answer to this situation. I don't have it. I don't have the means to accomplish this situation, God. God says, you're in luck. I, in, I excel in these. This, this is God's specialty. So here's this woman. I'm going to die like this afternoon. Me and my son, we have nothing left. And Elijah says, make me a little cake first. Now, I've read that. I honestly think I have preached this message probably more than any in my life, 1 Kings 17. I don't, my wife, she learned from her grandma a long time ago, right down in the Bible when I, and I think she filled up the margins on this page because I've preached on it so many times. It's one of my favorite things to preach on. And it's only been in the last little bit that I've recognized something about this story, Brenda. It's crazy. Elijah has been sitting by a brook for months drinking water that other people didn't have access to, and eating meat that other people didn't have. He has not missed a meal. As a matter of fact, he might have gained a little few pounds. Elijah may have come out with the buttons on his shirt stretching a little bit. He hasn't missed a meal. He's not hurting like the other people. He's not starving. His ribs aren't showing like the other kids. He has already eaten. So now think of it in this light. Think of it in the light that modern day media would portray it. Local pastor takes woman's last meal. And it shows a picture of him like with crumbs on his chin, shirt busting open. He doesn't, he hasn't missed a meal. He don't need this cake because he's starving like they are. So now I start thinking, what in the world? Elijah, are you, that's terrible, man. Seriously, you've come along, you just had like second breakfast this morning before you left the brook. You've had raven, you've had Uber with wings for months, deliver, you haven't even had to get up. And you just come in and the first thing you say to this dying woman is, give me some of your food? Before you, your son's going, you don't know how to keep your son alive past this afternoon, and I'm telling you, give me some of what he was going to eat before you feed him? Oh, my gosh. If you don't know the kingdom key and the kingdom principle that Elijah was trying to unlock for this woman, you would think that Elijah was a scumbag. If you didn't know that there's a key in the kingdom that Elijah knew about and had access to, and he just wanted to open it up and unlock it in this woman's life. And the kingdom principle was shown and taught in, in mass during Jesus' time when he said these simple words, give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, help me out, press down, shaken together, running over. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Whatsoever you sow, you shall reap. Kingdom principle, Elijah shows up. This woman is in need, desperate. Now, so he says, give to me 
a little bit of cake first. And she did it. I mean, you want to talk about... I can't tell you what I would say to a preacher who come along or showed up on the TV screen like they did in the 90s and early 2000s. God will fix all your money trouble if you just send me a check first. It's a bunch of garbage people did back then. It was not the same. And I'm going to show that to you here in a minute. He said, give to me a little bit first. And she did in faith. You know, I think she did that because she said, what else am I going to do? Think of how many times God's brought you to a desperate situation because he knew that's how I, if I get him to that desperate situation, they'll take a leap of faith. See, sometimes you've been in situations and you've, you've took a leap that you wouldn't have took had you not been that desperate. So this widow woman, she says, I'll do it. I can just see she's breaking off a little piece of hers. She breaks off a little piece of his. She grinds it together. She mixes it together and makes a little cake. That means she doesn't get as much as she was going to get. That means he doesn't get, the boy doesn't get as much as he was going to get. But she puts it together, pours a little bit of oil in there, all that she had left. Mixes it together, bakes it, gives it to Elijah. Elijah eats. She makes hers. She makes the sons. And they eat. And now, now what's going to happen? Here's the thing. Here's what ended up happening was... That was about lunchtime. Dinner time comes around. The son says, Mom, I'm hungry. And she says, Well, son, I used the last bit of oil this today for lunch. And Elijah, I, I could just imagine, go, go look. She goes in the kitchen. And, well, I'll be daggone. There's oil in here like I never even used it in the first place. Opens up a barrel. Well, I'll be, for heaven's sakes, there's some flour in here. I could have sworn I scooped the last little bit out of it. Sure enough, and she's got enough, and she makes some cake, and they have dinner. That next morning, I can just see breakfast time rolling around. Mom, I'm hungry. Well, son, I used the last and puts it up. Well, something's going on here. I know I scooped the last little bit out of here. And what's funny to me is she it doesn't say that she opened up the barrel and there was like flour up to the top or she had a thing and just, just dump it. All it said was every time she needed a meal from the barrel, it was there. Every time she needed oil from the cruise, it was there. Here's the thing. Some people say, man, I, I don't know. Does God want you wealthy? Does God want you this, that, and that? Here's all I know. He wants it to be where you never have to worry about where the next is coming from. You just know it's going to be there. That doesn't mean that I'm going to be, you know wealthy flowing with every need that I've ever had in abundance sometimes God does it that way other times all it means is God is going to make sure you have what you need and if you have a need it'll be there before you even reach for it he's going to take care of all of it but the key to it is give and it shall be given unto you what you sow you shall reap this woman needed food to be provided for her family. So she said, if that's, if that's what the Lord is requiring, that I need to reap a harvest of food for my family, guess what I need to sow? Brenda said it last week. We prayed a prayer years ago. We talked about the, the Lord. We need the Lord to bring a harvest to this church in the form of a building. And along come an opportunity GU coming along and saying, we need a building to practice in. And, to, and, and, and another church down in Cincinnati had no place to practice their music because they rented a hall at a school weekly. And I said, come and use our sanctuary. And, and we, we started sewing a building. We started saying, I'm going to give a building. Well, I'll be daggone if not. In a, what was it, 2018? Then I got a phone call. And long come this phone call, somebody said, you know, it's somebody I worked with 10 years ago, I hadn't even talked to them, hadn't thought about them, and they said, you know, we got this building, and we need to give it to a church. Whatsoever you sow, give, and it shall be. That's a kingdom principle that that woman learned about on that day, okay? She didn't get, 
she didn't get, you know, maybe in, in a super amount of abundance. I don't know. I don't know what happened with this woman. I'll guarantee you this. Elijah one day had to leave three years later. He left. I'll guarantee it till the day that woman died, she never had to go to the grocery store again. It just kept going because what God gives you when he honors what you've given and you are faithful, he'll turn around and say, I'll never let this thing run dry. Wow. So chapter number 18 of the book of 1 Kings, we're going to skip and we're going to go to verse 21. This is Elijah three years later. He's going, and God said, if you go and see Ahab, I'm going to send rain on the earth. So he goes, they've been looking for him. They want to kill Elijah. He's caused a lot of problems. And the prophets of Baal, about 450 of them, are up on this mountain. Is it Carmel? Somebody help me. Carmel, not caramel. Yeah. Some people ask me if I want caramel. I'm like, no, I don't know what that is, but I'll take some caramel. Say some things right. Why, why, you know what I mean? But anyway, I'm just kidding. Mount Carmel. And he goes up there, 450 prophets of Baal. And Elijah says, at some point in time, this has got to stop. We got to figure out how this is going to end. I like that. I like somebody who's not willing to just keep going and letting bad circumstances be there forever. Amen? So he says, this has got to come to a stop. Let's figure out what we're going to do. Top of Mount Carmel, verse 21. And Elijah came to all the people and said, how long are we going to let this go on? How long will you falter between two opinions? In other words, you're going to do this. You're going to be in this kingdom and understand the principles the kingdom keys cannot be something that you believe in one day, but you don't, you're not faithful to it another day. So you can't do that. How long will you falter between two opinions? If God is God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Pause. Everybody look at me. What he's saying is, the popular opinion is, we should keep trying this whole Baal thing. Because we got 450 people that want to do that. We got one guy who's got another idea, Elijah. He says, so the popular opinion Let's keep trying this thing that hasn't worked in three and a half years. One of the things about this kingdom key of give and it shall be given is that sometimes you've got to understand if you have never applied this principle and you say, man, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work out. Things aren't working out for me now. Sometimes God needs you to recognize if what you're doing now ain't working, Perhaps God's plan of this kingdom key is worthy of giving it a shot. Even if 450 prophets say this is the way. If you are going to act upon what God has called in the kingdom, if you are going to use these kingdom keys, know this, sometimes you will be the one who's looking different than everybody else. Everybody else is doing it this way. You're doing it this way. Do you understand that Jesus Christ, when people came to him uh, and wanted to come into the kingdom, if he found something wrong, he found something that... Let me just expose this right now for what it is. In one place, Jesus was encountered by a rich young man who come along and said, I want to follow you in the kingdom. I want to, I want to go with you. And Jesus said this. This is, what they, this is what they beat my brains in with as a kid. Jesus said, you lack one thing. Because the guy said, I've kept all the commandments. He's a, he's a, in other words, he's a good Jew. You know, He's a good practicing Orthodox church attending Jew at that time. And Jesus said, you lack something. You lack one thing. Sell all that you have 
and give to the poor. They beat my brains in with this when I was a kid. Because the church I went to, it was a broke contest. Anybody ever been to that church? You're more spiritual the more broke you are. All right. That's what they thought. And so they'd read this scripture and say, you see right there, Jesus couldn't do nothing with a man who's got money. Sell all you have and give to the poor. And then he turns around and, and, and Jesus is like preaching like, and then they just keep showing me these scriptures because Jesus turned around and said how hard it is for somebody with riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to fit through a needle's eye than it is for somebody with riches to enter into the kingdom of God. And they said, you see right there, you got that money, you ain't going to heaven. That's what they told me. What they forgot to tell me was, I think it's like a chapter later, Jesus walking through Jericho, and a man climbs a tree by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. And Jesus says, climb down on that tree and come here. I'm coming to your house today. Uh-oh, here's another rich fella. He was the richest man in town. He had more money than Davy Crockett. He had all kind of money. This Zacchaeus fella, loaded. Better watch out, Zacchaeus. Jesus don't like money. He's about to tell you something you don't want to hear. He's going to tell you, get rid of that money. You can't make it into heaven with all that money. Better brace yourself, Zacchaeus, and be ready to write a check, man, because you've got to get rid of that money. And Jesus says, how you doing, Zacchaeus? Everything you doing okay? He says, yeah, I'm doing great. I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've done anything, any, I'm, I'm, Jesus, I'm going through time in my life. I'm so blessed. I'm looking for people I've done wrong 15, 20, 25 years ago. I'm seeking them out and giving them whatever I wronged them with interest. Jesus said, good man. God bless you. Left. Wait a minute. You didn't tell him to get rid of his money. You said, good job. What was the difference? The rich young ruler had a giving problem. And Jesus said, you're going to have to get rid of that. Zacchaeus didn't have no giving problem. He gave half of what he had away. He was single-handedly keeping the city of Jericho afloat with all that he gave to the poor. That's the difference. So Jesus says to this rich young man, you can't make it in the kingdom of God. you got to give everything away. You can't make it in the kingdom of God. What was the difference? What the difference was, the rich young man had achieved his wealth in an earthly system. And in the earthly system, to get in abundance in your life, you hold on to it. You save. You heard a lot of people say, they, ain't rich, they don't get rich by giving it away. Hold on to it. You save. You put it in your own stuff. You invest in yourself. You, you, you lay up treasures here in your life and, and all this kind. That's the earth's system of gaining abundance. Jesus said, you ain't going to make it in my system because in my system, everything's flipped around. In my system, you will think, I, you, you will think I've lost my mind in my system because in my system, the more you give, the more it comes. So he says, you ain't going to make it. You're going to have to learn a whole new system and start over. And by the way, give away all you have. That's step one. And Jesus, that's what Jesus was telling the guy. Give away all you have. That's step one. And I'm going to show you a new system. And the guy wasn't having it. He said, nope, I'm going home. He missed out. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if, you already, if you've already done it the earthly way, this is going to seem strange to you. That's why Elijah is here one man about to do something that 450 will think is strange. That's okay. Be prepared for the fact that when you are in the kingdom executing his keys, you're going to look strange sometimes. So he says to them, he says, it's all right, I got it. Uh, you guys call on your God or your gods and you guys go first. So they go to the altar of the Lord. 
this altar of the Lord, which is not in Jerusalem. This is the northern kingdom of Israel on the mountain there. And the, the altar is built with stones. And they call upon their God and nothing happens. Okay? Elijah says, take your time. Don't, don't let it be said that I hurried you up too fast and your God, take all the time you need. If you need till tomorrow, I'll be here. You go until you can't go no more. Call upon. Do you know that in some cases, God said, test me. Test me. One of those places, one of the only places that he described about test, give it a try, test me, is in the book of Malachi, chapter 3 and chapter 4. And in the book of Malachi, the only place where God says test me was in this. He said, in your giving to the kingdom, test me and see if I will not Y'all remember, I've taught you for weeks about the blessings of God are in the heavenlies. We have to access the heavenlies. God said that Jesus is the door. You go through the door, the door opens, you have access to the heavenlies. Jesus is that door. But here's the deal. God showed his people in the book of Malachi, test me and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. Okay? This is, this is about God meeting your needs, folks. This is about God being, this is about you being able to say, I may not know every step. I may not know where exactly God's taken me at the end of all this, but I know this. As long as I'm walking where he's put my footsteps, if I have a need, heaven's going to give it. So Elijah says, try it. You guys try your way. Let's make sure your way isn't going to work. And it didn't work. They jumped up and down. They cut themselves. Weirdest thing. Cut their arms, I don't know, legs, all kind of stuff. I don't know what they were trying to do there, but I know this. I know that there will come a time in your life if, if what the world if the, if the earthly way has ever worked for you, eventually it won't. No matter what. And, and, and you will actually harm yourself trying to get it to work. Cause harm in your life. And the enemy is silent. Not, not this time. So Elijah says, my turn. Guys, I'm going to read, I'm going to skip um, down to verse 32. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seahs of seed. Elijah is rebuilding an altar that had been torn down a long time ago. You want these kingdom keys to work? Specifically, you want this kingdom key to work in your life? Whatever you have neglected in the kingdom, now it's time to build it back the way it's supposed to be. Get things right. Get things right. Get, it, get them built back. And he says, dig a trench around this thing. They dig a trench. He put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, making the sacrifice, laid it on the wood, and he said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. They did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. Pause right there. Get that altar rebuilt. Get things back in order. And now, this is, this is something amazing to me. Sow into the kingdom with purpose. 
Nobody who plants seed ever scatters it out there and says, I wonder what I'm going to get. The only way to know what's growing is to either stand around and wait until it sprouts and see what it is, or you simply just know what seed did you plant. That's what's going to grow. So flip that around. If you know what you need to grow in this field, then you already know what seed needs to be there. We needed a building. What we have to sow? Building. Hasn't rained in three and a half years. What do they need? Water. Elijah knows kingdom principles and keys that nobody else knows. What do they need? Water. What do they need God to answer with? The, the water. He's going to answer with fire, but the, what they need to provide? Rain. Water. That's what they need. So Elijah says, we got to sow a seed. What are they going to sow? Water. Why is that? Why? Because that is precious seed. The Bible says, he who goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed. Precious seed is, this is all I have left. That's the seed. You know, they have a harvest and by the time that planting time comes around, things are getting low in the storehouse. You need a harvest in a few months to come. But you can't eat all that seed. You need some of it to plant. And they set some aside, and that's precious seed. And it says, he who goes forth weeping. Let me tell you why they're weeping. Because the farmer had to pick up that seed that they could have made food with and walk past hungry kids Walk past a wife when I, we don't, we have to ration what we have left and having to look at people wishing they could consume this, but him knowing we can't, this is precious seed. We need it. We need to plant it or else we won't have a harvest. And he has to walk past kids that he knows is hungry. He has to walk past family that he knows could eat this. And he, by the time he gets out the door and going to the field, he's got tears flowing down his face because this is what? A sacrifice. And it causes him anguish. In other words, it hurts him. It affects him. But he knows he has to do it. He who goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again and reap a harvest. When they needed water, what was precious was water. They didn't have much. But he said, in this kingdom, whatsoever you sow, you shall reap. And he says, pour four pitchers of water in that trench. And I never noticed this until I studied for this today. They poured the four pitchers of water into the trench and Elijah watched it happen. And at that point, he just said, he said, it's not enough. Get me four more. They poured it in there. He said, still not enough. Get me four more. And God, I, I'm not, it's not written in here, but God opened my eyes to something that I believe it was. You can take this how it is. I believe Elijah was doing this and he said, we're going to keep doing this until I can see that it hurts you. Strange. Because he's like, pour the water in. They poured it in, and he noticed, well, that didn't bother them very much. Give me four more. Four more, and they went, poured it. They're like, eh, you know. It's like, hmm. Get me four more. They went, oh, four more? We're running out. Oh, and they're like, well, don't spill it. You said four more? And he says, now it's enough. Now it's costing you something. You remember when that woman gave him water from the well without hesitation? That didn't mean anything. That was customary. God's kingdom does not work when you just do what is superficially normal, customary. You got to do more until you feel it. And I believe Elijah was watching, and they gave, and it didn't, 
didn't bother them. Do more. They gave, didn't bother them. They said, give again. And they gave the water, and he could tell, that hurt. That's enough. David, one time, a fellow by that was at Ornan, a, a, a fellow was going to give David this threshing floor for free. Build your temple on there. Every pastor's dream. Take it for free. And David said, I can't do that. I'm sorry. This is for God, and I cannot put his temple on this ground. Why? I cannot accept for the Lord that which cost me nothing. It's not a sacrifice. So they pour the water on there. The water gets poured on, and, and it's in the trench, and I'm about to close, and it, it, it's in the trench, and he starts to pray, and he prays a prayer. I don't even think it's a 60-word prayer. These other 450 prophets prayed all day long. They got scars on their arms and legs. They're bleeding. They've done all kinds of goofy stuff, nothing. But the minute somebody sowed seed into the need, all it took was Elijah simply saying, God, show up. We're here. We need your answer. And God did what he did not do for any of the other prophets for three and a half years. And he did for one man in one 50-some-odd word prayer. God answered it. What was the difference? Seed had been given into it. And that's the principle. Today, you know what you need for God to do in your life. You know exactly how you need God to answer in your life. You know exactly what you need heaven to pour down. That's, that's great news because if you know what you need, then you know what the seed should be. So he did all of this, and he showed the people, and he said, God is still the answer of prayers. But in this kingdom, given it shall be given unto you. Whatsoever you sow, you shall reap. Amen? God's taught me a lot of lessons, some of them a long time ago, some of them recently. Something very important. God will never bless you with anything until you have first shown you will serve him even if you don't have that. Y'all remember three Hebrew children getting ready to be thrown in the fiery furnace, wouldn't bow down to the false idol? They said, well, who's the God you're willing to go into the fire for? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, and they said, the God we serve is able to deliver us from the fire. But if he doesn't, I'll still serve him. See, one thing God's got to get out of the church and one thing God has got to get out of his kingdom is the number of people who are putting stipulations on whether or not they're going to serve him, whether or not they're going to listen to him, whether or not they're going to obey him. Some people are waiting for God to meet the need first, and now, God, I'll do it. How many prayers have ever been prayed in a foxhole somewhere along the line saying, God, get me out of this and I'll serve you? And by the grace of God, God has met needs for you in your past, even when he said, I know they ain't going to follow through. But by, the great, by his grace, he has sustained you this long. And he said, my kingdom needs to be stronger than that. And my kingdom needs to be one that says, I'm not in this and putting stipulations on God, you got to do this. And then I'll do that. Mm -mm. What God designed is God says, you meet me where I have called you to be faithful and do what I've shown in my word. And I'll be there, and when you, re when you open the barrel and have a need, it's going to be in there. When you need to pour something out and it be there, you, it's, it's going to be there. That's what he said. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, I know he can, but that ain't why I'm here. I'm here because of who he is. If he gets me out of this fire, awesome. If he don't, I don't care. I still serve him, and I will not bow to any other God. Stand to your feet, if you will. God has called upon us to understand how his kingdom works and how his kingdom works is we, we are in this thing for him. I'm in this thing for him. And what he needs me to do is to pour myself and sow myself into his kingdom. And God will meet every need according to 
your seed. Amen? What that which you have given, that which you sow, you also shall reap. Give and it shall be given unto you. Bow your heads if you will. Lord God Almighty, I thank you so much for all that you have done. God, I thank you so much for these two series that we have just been through. God, it's been such an enlightening time. It's been such a revelatory time, and you are just getting started. And I thank you, Lord Heavenly Father, for your word that's gone out and touched the lives of people. But God, you have called upon us to move first. So today I'm, I'm saying you have, you have met the needs of your people as they sow themselves into you. So first and foremost, I pray that if there's any that need to come into this kingdom now today by the salvation of Jesus Christ, let them sow themselves into your kingdom right now. Let them give themselves unto you. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let that be done for somebody today. And God, I'm asking and praying that you will strengthen us and strengthen our faith. God, that you, that, that you have shown us so many things that are enlightening about your kingdom. We are excited about them. But God, these things require diligence and faithfulness. And that God help us to be strong and to do as you have said in your word. Put this to the test and see if heaven will not open up its own windows and pour out blessing. Pour out a blessing that you cannot contain. God, I'm asking in the precious name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that you will do all these things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All that will come to this altar and I want